Thank you, Tom. Well, thank you all for, for having me and having me back. Um, I am an alum of Stanford, and because I have a fellow classmate in the audience, I'll confess I'm the class of 80. Um, so that was, that was some time ago. And uh, it's, it's really a treat uh, in life to be able to, to come back uh, to where you started and, and not to be sitting there, but actually to be, to be standing here. So it's a, real, it's a real treat for me. And it's a real treat to be, uh, to be speaking here because working in Silicon Valley, STVP bases, you know, what you guys do is very well known. Um, throughout our community. So we talk a lot about what's happening here. We want to tap into what you guys are thinking, uh, the trends that you guys are following. So it is great to, um, to, be, to be part of this. So thank you for having me be part of this. So the agenda that I thought I would talk about um, is a few things. Uh, first, I thought I would start with my career. It's a bit unusual. Some of the people that you have come speak here, you don't have to Google to understand what they've done. Uh, me, you'll find those, some things when you Google, but you had to Google to find out. Um, so we'll look at my career sort of as a Petri dish um, to talk about maybe a more unique path um, forward. I'll stand back then and talk a little bit about venture capital. Uh, the benefit of being a venture capitalist is you get the benefit of pattern recognition. You get to see lots of uh, successes, uh, lots of failures, lots of different flavors of success, different flavors of failures, of course, as well. Um, and it's a great opportunity to continue to learn. So I'll share some of that um, back uh, to you. And then I'll end kind of with some thoughts about how you all might think about your career, many of you in the process of, uh, of building your career. Um, but before I do so, I want to do a poll on two, two dimensions. One is uh, students. Uh, how many of you are students? Oh, good. A good, I'd say, 55, 60%. That's great. That's great uh, for those of you watching the video. And the other thing I want to know is how many of you would consider yourself, whether you're students or not, uh, ha having STEM degrees, science, technology, engineering, math? How many would fall into that? Probably slightly more, maybe 65%, but not entirely. That's great. That's great. Well, um, I will start with where I started, which is uh, Stockton, California, which probably has more to do with the middle of, of the United States in some ways than it does here. Uh, coming here was very, very different for me. I'm the oldest of five daughters. My father come from a family of engineers. In fact, my grandfather opened the Ames Research Center at Moffett Field. He was employee number three. He ran all the instrumentation, so really early Silicon Valley. Um, my father got three engineering, three engineering degrees from Stanford, uh, two, ME, one, uh, two CE, one ME. Um, when I told him I was going to take political science, not only was he appalled, but he couldn't believe they called it science. He's like, where's the science? I get the politics, but where's the science? So his big focus for me uh, when I was on campus uh, was two things. One, because uh, we came from a solidly you know, middle class family, um, his message to me is that your um, inheritance is your education. There isn't going to be more after that. In fact, I took out big student loans to get through Stanford. Uh, he said, so spend it wisely. So my education is, is and you know, was and, and remains my greatest treasure. Um, number two, he referred to all of his daughters as the guys. And for the women in the audience, that was great. Because in my business, it's mainly guys. So I just respond whenever somebody says, hey, guys, come on. I don't think they're excluding me. So, uh, so those, those lessons um, have stayed with, me, stayed with me through life. When I graduated, it was in 1980, um, Lloyd Lance, uh, my, my, uh, my uh, fellow classmate and, and now uh, fellow businessman, um, we knew it was, a, it was a hard time. I mean, it was a horrible recession. It was the last big recession. Uh, I came from a family where I didn't have a big safety net financially. Not long after I graduated, my father passed away, so that became very real. As the oldest daughter with my youngest uh, of the family, uh, five daughters, with my youngest sister being 17 years younger, she was a child, um, being able to care for me and help my family was really important. I was really afraid when I graduated, frankly. So I wasn't in the position to take kind of risks that many people can, uh, and maybe even I can now in life. I really needed to get a job. So I ended up, as I'd been you know, cycling down to University Avenue to be a teller during school at a bank, at a bank to help make money to pay for Stanford. Um, I looked around, and one of the places it was that had opportunities was banking. And you kind of wonder, why 
banking. Why did you choose banking? And it was interesting. I, it ended up, I'll tell you, there are two things. One is I cared because I did, I did need a job. They paid well, um, relatively well. Um, I can tell you, I, mean, I made $13,000 a year. Isn't that shocking? And that was better than a lot of other people. So I was thankful for that. Um, but the most important thing, and this will be a theme you'll hear from me, um, is I got to learn. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I graduated. You know, Stanford is not a, a trade school. It's a school that teaches you how to think, which was incredibly valuable. But that didn't help me figure out exactly at that point what I wanted to do. And I didn't know a whole lot really about what I wanted to do. My father had been a civil engineer. He designed levees and water systems. Uh, where I grew up in Stockton, most of the people either you know, most of the people worked on the land, a few people owned it. I didn't have a lot of role models. I really couldn't, I, I really didn't, couldn't picture necessarily what I wanted to be. And the thing I really liked about, about banking was that, and I, this early on in my interview, my first job, as I was, one of my first interviews, I didn't take the job, but I remember this guy, I wish I'd remembered his name, because it stayed with me around banking specifically. He talked about, and he was a senior vice president, he was a big guy, and he said, oh, I've been able to have so many careers within banking. And he'd done so many different things when the auspices of a large bank. And in my own career, I was able to do finance. I was able to do marketing. I was able to do IT. I really got to try on different hats. So I got to learn. I got a job, which is what I really needed, <laughs> a reliable paycheck. But in particular, I got to continue to scale. And, and we'll talk more about scale venture partners. Scale is kind of a theme um, that we'll talk about, scaling companies, scaling us as individuals. At 5.2, that's still an aspirational statement for me. <laughs> I hope to scale further. Um, but it really allowed me to really start to scale and think about, about what I could possibly do. My last assignment in banking was what then was called, it was in the early 90s, it was called interactive banking. Um, I had been managing IT. I'd taken computer science when it, before it was really a department at Stanford. It was, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, I'd taken it somewhat as a, as a minor. Um, and I, so I, my husband worked at Apple. I, I had obviously a lot of sense of what was beginning to happen down here. I'd been managing some IT departments before then, and it was great. I went to talk to, I was, at that point, I was one of the youngest senior vice presidents the bank had had at that point. This is Bank of America at this stage. And um, I, I walked into this guy, and he wanted, he said, you're a woman in banking. You should, you should, you know, take the opportunity to, to uh, you know, run a big department. I'm like, oh my God, it sounds awful. Um, and I really was interested in this whole online banking thing. But it still, it was the early 90s. I mean, AOL was just starting out. And he said, you know, if this internet thing doesn't work out, no one will blame you. It'll just be because that internet thing didn't work out. Well, the good news is the internet thing worked out. Um, I worked with Netscape when it was still a private company, so my second uh, interaction with, uh, with Jim Clark. Um, the uh, Craig Newmark, uh, who some of you probably know of, he should be, would be a great teacher for you to have here, by the way. He's, he's an incredible guy, uh, really bright, and an incredible, incredible force in terms of the community um, these days as well. Just, just impressive. He actually wasn't an employee. He was a consultant because he was starting this thing called Craigslist. Um, so it was sort of the wild, wild west. And once I got bitten with that bug, um, going and staying in banking was no longer the right place for me to be. So at that point, I really was looking south from San Francisco is where my offices were and thinking about what I wanted to do. And I was really fortunate to get swept up into what was then called Bank America Ventures. And it was great, the guy who, who, had, who had been running it um, understood I had both finance and, and technology background. I understood our source of capital at the point at that point was B of A. So they thought this is great, you know. So so move on to do that, and that was in '96. And you know at that stage when I got out of school, venture you know was really nascent. In '96, it, it had been going for a while, but it still wasn't um, what what it is at all today. Um, and obviously that started leading up from '96 on right into the the big bubble um, that that you've all that you've all heard about. And I ended up getting a great experience in the late 90s. I got a quick um, uh, lesson on, on cycles, uh, late 90s, 2000, post-2000. Um, <laughs> that was sort of fast, fast forward. I got to learn uh, how to make investments. It's a very hard thing to do. It's a high-risk business. You don't have a lot of data to go on. Um, you have a lot of belief. There's a way to qualify that investing uh, judgment, but that's the best you can do. So I learned how to make good investment decisions. I learned how to make bad investment decisions, um, and hopefully to do more of the former uh, than the latter. Learned how to be a board member, which is different than when I was an operator. When I was running things, 
uh, you know, and I, we had a group and we could make things happen. Um, it, it, it took one set of skills. When you're a board member, you're really facilitating and influence managing, helping give pattern recognition to a CEO that knows a heck of a lot more than, than you do. It's a very different role. It took, it took a while for me to, to get the hang of that um, and, and really learn to, to love it. Um, again, I get to continue the opportunity to learn. And in particular, I think the most luxurious thing about venture capital is that I get the chance to meet people like you who know a lot more about the specific area you're studying. You come in and share with me what you're working on, you're passionate about it, you tell me the context, you compare it to other things. Every day is like you uh, students get um, to sit in a class and get to learn. It is, it's phenomenal. I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great experience. It played to my strengths. And later I'll talk to you about how, when you think about your own career, how to think about that. I was good in finance, despite the fact I tried really hard to be a liberal arts major. Um, numbers are, are really the language that's uh, most common to me. But I also like people, I like communicating, I like team building. So that, that whole piece of it worked, worked really well for me. Um, the other thing is, you know, as I moved along in, in venture, I became the managing director um, of Scale Venture Partners. And what we, uh, when my partner and I, uh, Rory founded, Rory O'Driscoll founded the, what is now Scale Venture Partners in 2000 at the peak of the bubble, um, not for the faint of heart. We looked, we, you know, we looked around and, and looked at all the different firms, said, should we, should we go somewhere else and start up? Should we start our own? And we decided, you know, work with people that you really trust and, and move forward. And the other thing that we decided was each one of us should play to our strengths, and one of my strengths being managing and, and, and building teams. So one of my portfolio companies is Scale Venture Partners. Like many of you who are or want to be CEOs, um, I help, I'm not the CEO of the firm, I have no more economics or anything else, but I help you know, hire, think about building, think about changing, uh, thinking about the challenges when you have to fire, when you have to change, um, are things healthy, do they need repair? Um, that becomes one of my, one of my portfolio companies, and I, I love that, that piece um, of what I get to do for the, for the firm. Uh, you know, and after then spending some time in venture, learning a lot from it, uh, as Tom mentioned, got to be or asked to be chairman of the National Venture Capital Association. That's an industry uh, uh, group um, that does lobbying and policy work in Washington. We'll talk a little bit about that and what I care about there uh, a little bit later. But also sort of speaks for the industry um, because we're lucky. We're in the middle of Silicon Valley. So many of you know what a lot of what you know, I experience and see because you're in the midst of it um, here in the rest of the country and certainly around the world, this is really not, not as well known. So I've spent time speaking at places like Michigan and Tuck and Pepperdine and, and, and other schools um, internationally. I've spent some time speaking in Shanghai um, to, to folks. Um, and so it, it, it was a great opportunity to, to represent the industry. I was the third woman in 40 years to have the opportunity to do that. Um, that as chairman. That is uh, way over the average in terms of uh, the percentage of women in the industry. Um, it's, I think, less than 5%. That would be obviously closer to 7.5 or 8. So uh, a great opportunity for me. And then my last task, if you will, before I step down from that chairmanship, that's a part-time nonprofit sort of thing I did in addition to my day job as being a VC, was something called the Jobs Act that Tom referred to. And I, I, that was exciting to me. I'd done a lot of work around sort of inside baseball things uh, in Washington on Dodd-Frank and other issues. Um, this was an opportunity. I was in a meeting at the Treasury Department. Um, they were going around the room and, and talking about how do you get more capital to small companies. That was the theme of, of this, this meeting we had at the, at the Treasury Department. And I raised my hand and volunteered to get a group of people together entrepreneurs, uh, institutional investors, folks like myself, securities lawyers, et cetera, to brainstorm some solutions to make it easier, in particular for small companies to go public. Um, that was about 18 months ago. Um, a little bit over a year ago, we, uh, we put together a, a plan uh, in front of Congress to, uh, to make that happen. It became a bill, got signed about a year ago, and I ended up in the Rose Garden sitting about this far from the president watching him sign this into, into law. I will say there were more poli-sci majors in that crowd. Those were my people. Those were my people. Um, it was, I finally got to use that, use that degree. Um, but it was, it, was, um, it was a great opportunity for me. And frankly, you know, at Scale Venture Partners, I'll talk more about what we do. 
Um, but the best part of what we do is get to spend time with entrepreneurs. Um, it's exciting. What you guys do is really what creates uh, growth um, and innovation. And this was an opportunity at a policy level for me to help entrepreneurs sort of smooth the way um, as they, they go to build you know, great big companies. So uh, you know, when I think about that arc of my career so far, again, one of my themes is sort of scaling and learning. Um, sort of what am I up to now? Sort of two things. One is really focused on the next generation at scale. Um, and I'm really proud of the team and really proud of what I see in the firm as the next generation leaders. And it's a funny time in your career, you know, where you're sitting, or at least most of you are sitting, your goal is to build your own career and to, to hit a phase where your goal is to build, to truly build somebody else's and let them, them step forward and you stand back, probably a lot like it is to be a professor um, at Stanford and, and where your real joy comes from seeing them do really well. And, and I'm at that stage seeing, seeing my partners do incredibly well. The other thing is I'm on the board of Silicon Valley Bank, which amazingly enough is the synthesis between <coughs> banking and venture capital and the whole uh, innovation ecosystem and who, who knew that you could marry those two things together. So it's a wonderful opportunity for me to exercise both my long-term background and, and my last uh, almost 20 years in, in venture. Um, and it's a great opportunity for me to learn. It's really different than the boards um, I sit on now. The boards I sit on now as a venture investor, it's you, the owner, the entrepreneur. It's uh, other owners who are typically investors, maybe one or two independent members, but everyone, all the constituents are either in the room or right outside in the hall. Um, so we have a very different, much closer to you know, the owners of the entity. Well, at Silicon Valley Bank, um, I'm learning a few things. One is I'm a fiduciary for people who are not even in the building, and I take that really seriously. I'm chairman of the compensation committee. You know, um, for those of you that follow public boards, that's the hot seat right now. Um, and I take it, you know, very seriously. I'm representing a group of people who don't have as direct a voice as they do in the, in the, in the investments that I make. And that's just an incredibly steep learning curve. And the other thing, again, I'm used to smaller companies where culture is an easier thing to develop. It's all of us in a room. It's, it's groups this size that if we spend enough time together, we in this room could build a culture. Well, you know, Silicon Valley Bank is a much larger institution with offices around the world. How do you build and maintain a culture in an organization that large? And it's great to see, and it's an incredible culture. It's an incredible um, source of innovation. For those of you that are interested in thinking about, and I think that's one of the reasons you're in this, in this class, um, about building startups, go to their website. They have an incredible set of resources for entrepreneurs. They have something called the Accelerator Program. They do a lot to help folks like you think about how you might want to build, build a company and, and they have videos on their website, so, so do go check it out. So I'm still, I'm still learning um, I, and, and that's my uh, life goal. I started doing it here and I want to keep doing it forever. So um, at one point I thought about doing slides and, and I was going to title this part Lessons Learned and then I was going to retitle it and say Lessons I Wished I Learned Earlier. So I'll share them with you because hopefully you will learn them earlier than, than I did um, because now that I look back they seem you know, incredibly obvious. The, the first thing is you know, am I a horizontal or a vertical person? What do I mean by that? Um, I've heard people say do I build cathedrals or do I hit golf balls? Neither is good or bad. Um, but do you want to get, let's say, a PhD in engineering and you really, you know, you want to be involved in, in, you know, core engineering, core discovery, core research, really important to the eco, I mean, we wouldn't be here in Silicon Valley without that. Um, the founders of Google obviously started out very vertical. They've obviously become very successful horizontal, but very good vertically. Or do you have what I finally recognized in myself, more horizontal skills, more about bringing things together, consensus, pattern recognition, judgment, execution, sort of moving things forward, a bit more about building, building something. So knowing that about yourself early on is, is really helpful. In and you might decide to start with one and evolve. Again, the founders of Google have, um, Larry and Sergey. But you know, how, do you, how, how do you see yourself? And what is it that you really want to do? And be honest with yourself about that. The thing that, that I probably have learned the most in the last decade um, is, is really understanding not just what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, if you're smart, you're listening to people around you giving you advice, and you, you understand that. But you all got here because you did well, probably in all the classes you took um, to get here. Um, I sort of had this view that, well, if I have weaknesses, if I work hard enough, I should be able to do that. 
I mean, I may need to study an extra hour than you do to, to pass that physics class you know, per week. But if I take that extra hour, I should be able to do that. Maybe I, 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 maybe, maybe I can't and maybe I shouldn't. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, I'm really good at judgment, pattern recognition, people side of things, organizing things, execution. I'm not terribly strategic. I wish I was. Um, those people that can think out of the box and be really innovative and come at things orthogonally, that's just not me. So what I you know, figured out over time is instead of wishing I was more strategic or trying to be more strategic, that's pitiful, um, I do the best when I make sure I surround myself with people who are. And I listen for people instead of thinking, where did that thought come from? Thinking, where did that thought, co thought come from? That might be interesting to add to my thinking. So actually embracing that you can't be everything and that the best people in any function figure out how to complement themselves is incredibly empowering and sort of finally liberating once you finally, finally get around to that. Took me, took me longer. Um, the other thing, and I got this early on in banking in particular, and then I hung on to it, was the thought about mentors. It's one of the reasons I chose, I chose banking was I had the sense of the people I was meeting with, that I had people that, that would be my champions. Um, and, and how do I think about that? I was listening to uh, uh, City Arts and Lectures where um, Secretary Rice, I guess she's Condi Rice um, on campus, was interviewing Sheryl Sandberg about Lean In. And they were, as a side part of that whole conversation, they were talking about mentors. And I think it was Condi who was saying, yeah, you know, I go, I, I do these talks, and afterwards somebody comes up to me and says, will you be my mentor? And she says to them, who are you? What's your name? Um, and, and I thought, well, that was revealing. And I, I've had that happen. And you always feel so bad because somebody's really being vulnerable and asking you to, to do that. And this is how I think of, of mentors um, in my career. And it's been incredibly useful. First of all, that uh, some of the people who are my mentors don't know they're my mentors, by the way. I don't call them that. I refer to them that now. Um, but I didn't say, you know, you're my mentor. Number two, um, they weren't just people who would give me advice. Um, they were people who really believed in my success. They weren't necessarily going to tell me what they thought was important, perhaps, for them, but really my, what might be best for me. And they had to earn my trust in that regard first. I had to actually spend time with them to realize he really does care about, about what I'm thinking. He's really listening to what I'm saying. He, he's watching my strengths and weaknesses. That's probably somebody who I want feedback from. And I actually built a composite. If I had a mentor, it was a composite of people. I wanted people who are peers, ultimately now people not only who are senior to me, but people who are junior to me um, who give me advice. I get, and I want people who are close to what I do, and I want people who are further away from what I do. Because all of those things help me put a good picture around myself that really help me understand what I'm doing well and what I'm not. I think having champions in your career are really, really important, particularly early on. But think about that. You know, you're earning their trust, but you're, they're earning yours too. And think about putting together this composite mentor idea. It's incredibly powerful. The other thing about those mentors, and again, you all got here because you, 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 you got A's and you got lots of compliments and, and you did well and positive reinforcement really works well. The thing that you have to learn early on is make it easy for them to tell you the hard thing. Um, go to them and start the conversation with, you know, I really want your advice. These are some things I want to do better and I don't think I do well. Open the door. Some of the things they might tell you might be personal habits that you didn't know you had. Twitches, you know, I tend to speak too quickly. I've heard that many times. I probably will hear it till the day I die. Um, and it's always good advice to get. Make it easy for someone to give you feedback. It is incredibly valuable if you really listen to it um, to get that kind of feedback and, and take it on board. And ask for it repeatedly. It, it's hugely helpful. The other thing early on in your career is to keep as wide, a, wide an aperture as, as possible. Because you don't know what's going to happen with you. You may not know yourself, you may, but you also don't know what's going to happen around you. Um, computer science wasn't a, a big major on campus. Um, venture capital was nascent, um, really, in, in 1980. The things that I've ended up being able to do didn't even exist. So you know, to have become too narrow too early would have been negative. My, my nephew is an Emmy grad out of Michigan, gra um, undergraduate and masters. Um, he comes from a family of, of artists, really fabulous graphic artists. And early on, he said, well, gosh, maybe I want to be from, by the way, a very small town in upstate Michigan. 
So again, not a lot of exposure, just like me. Traverse City is a lot like, like Stockton. And he said, maybe I should be in, I mean, get a graduate degree in architecture. And I said, why don't you wait for a little bit, and before you narrow yourself down, think it through, maybe do some, get some, some internships, think a little bit more. Interesting, left fast forward, he has worked for a series of companies helping A, design uh, hardware, um, in technology, you know, a lot of the companies uh, in the valley, um, and now works for a company called um, HTC, helping them with their mobile phones, and he's helping sort of marry the design phase with the manufacturing phase, because you want to design things that are manufacturable, spends a lot of time uh, traveling to Asia, um, and it really feels like, you know, the world right now is, is, is oyster and very, very thrilled about that. Turns out to not only be good vertically, but have some great horizontal skills. So again, had he decided to do something perhaps narrower earlier, he might not have had the opportunity he's had um, out here. And it's just, it's been great to, great to watch. And the last thing I would say that I learned, and I, I, I feel this more all the time, when you're interviewing for your first job, and I, I will say this to anybody who comes see me one-on-one, um, that you know, the opportunity to learn. Think about it when you are interviewing for that job. Not only are you trying to impress the person you're talking to, it's a great brand name, it's Apple, it's Google, it's Facebook, it's IBM, it's whatever it is the firm that, that you want to work with. Um, you should be thinking in your mind, not only do I think this will be, a, you know, a good job for me, what am I going to learn and will I learn from the people I'm talking to? Because sponsor, again, back to that mentorship, that championship, all that, I, I strongly advise don't worry about the last two or $3,000. Um, in fact, I, it was very popular, Lloyd will remember this, when I graduated from campus, it was very popular to go into investment banking that did pay more than the $13,000 I made. Um, but not a whole lot, but more. Um, but I was looking for an opportunity where I could distinguish myself a little bit more, and where I had the opportunity to learn, and where I felt I would have unique sponsors, as opposed to being in a in kind of a class where I was being guided through. So I chose something that paid a little bit less because I thought I could learn more. Think about that trade-off; it will repay itself to you many times over. Um, over that small amount of difference, day one is is not really not really going to matter. So that um, is a little bit about my petri dish. So now I'll stand back and. Take it back to the, the macro. I'll give you um, a little background on Scale Venture Partners, um, on what we do. So it'll give you context on how we think about startups. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the industry, because um, it's going through its own a little bit of change. Then I'll talk a bit about how you might think about um, building a startup. And then I'll end with thinking about how you might build your own career as an entrepreneur. I'm going to check how we are with timing. Oh, great. Um, you know, at Scale Venture Partners, um, as the name suggests, um, we like scaling companies. We invest in early in revenue technology companies just as they're beginning to scale. So we might work with an engineering founder who might be building out their, their sales and marketing team. Um, they may, they probably, they do typically, in our case, have revenue. It might be 100,000, though. Could be as high as 50 million. That's rare for us. The average is, is a bit less than 5 million when we invest. But the company is still figuring out, can I sell this product? Can I sell it repeatedly? Ultimately, can I sell it profitably? So we invest when it's still relatively modest burn rate. We might be figuring out, is it direct? Is it indirect? Is it freemium? Um, a couple, I'm writing a blog for the Wall Street Journal. I just did an article, uh, blog on, on pricing. You know, that's a lot of what we help people think through, and that's part of the experiments we're running when we initially invest. The first phase of investment is, does the product work? The second phase of the investment is, can we bring it to market? Can we get it in the user's hands? And how do we do that? And then after that, uh, we invest. Then the later stage is really ramping it up and then ultimately scaling. And, Getting that slope of that curve to really to really bend to really bend upwards, we are thematic in the way we invest. That's our first investment decision: is which markets do we think are ready for to, to take off? For us to make the kinds of returns we need to satisfy our institutional investors, we really need to be in not just a company that's dominant in its sector. We need to be in a sector that has uh, you know a tailwind behind it. Might be something you should think about with respect to your to your career um, as well, because we need to be. It, it, you know, there has to be. You know, the wind has to be at our back. We can't just be in a good, the best company in an okay market to get that kind of doubling every year of revenue. 
five, 10, 20, you know, to 50 on, um, it really needs to be in a market that's taking off. So we're very thematic. We spend a lot of time, and in fact, um, we bring uh, Stanford uh, grad, we usually like engineering and some business background to come in in the summer, help us actually use technology to, to think it through, uh, to really get hands on, to think is this a market that's really happening now, and then think about outbound calling, about how do we find the best company in that sector. It might be nascent, might still be in a university. We may watch it for a couple years, um, or is it already formed and a little bit a little bit more mature and then when we invest our partners have all helped build companies I helped build that you know various uh, entities with within B of A ultimately took you know B of A was the first bank online first bank a, uh, if to have online banking you know grew all that you know hundreds of people as employees I have a partner who started at SGI and then Sun and scaled yeah. their their finance business from nothing to a billion in revenue, a partner that was chief marketing officer at AMD. So people that really know how to build things. So we really help, you know, again, pattern recognition, help give entrepreneurs ideas, network, things they can think about within something they know a lot better and they're experts on building, building, their, building their company. So that's what we do. And I'd say, you know, we too have evolved um, and learned a lot. And I think the thing that we've learned a lot that applies to you all thinking about building companies now is how different financing companies, startups, is than it was 20 years ago. It used to be you'd spend a lot of money to, to build the technology, be a lot of IP, and then your goal was to get to cash flow break even. That was, that was the passion um, over time. So a lot of money went in initially, and then you'd, you'd, you'd get to the point where you know, you'd get more revenue and, and ultimately pass over into cash flow profitability. Well, we kind of have turned that on, their, on our heads because it is so, so much cheaper, particularly in the tech space, particularly in software, to build the technology. That can be done with really sometimes very little capital. Um, the initial testing of sales and marketing where we come in also doesn't take a lot of capital. You know, you do a lot online. Um, a lot of is done, you know, self-serve, freemium, you know, converting people from freemium, et cetera. Doesn't take a lot of capital. What really takes a lot of capital is that later stage scaling. So what we do is just at the point where we think we can land the plane, we know that we can sell this thing if cast, you know, efficiently. Uh, we can, it's, it's uh, capital efficient, it's, it can get to cash flow positive. That's when we start burning lots of cash. It's actually, from a risk point of view, a relatively low risk stage. We're burning sales and marketing dollars which you can turn on and off. And we calibrate sales efficiency within our companies, and it goes deeper than Gap, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that later. But we calibrate this, it's like watching a dashboard. When we think it's doing well, we, we really start burning. Um, because we really want to make this company number one, two, or three in its sector. Because that's, again, how you build a big company. They're rare. Uh, we've been lucky to be an Omniture. It was sold a couple uh, years ago to Adobe for um, uh, 1.8 billion. Company um, exact target went public on the New York Stock Exchange the day the Jobs Act was passed in, in Congress, um, and, um, and that a billion and a half outcome. Uh, a lot of you may know companies like Box in the Valley Now, um, a really high growth company. They all followed a very similar path, proving it out early on modest amounts of capital, and then really working to become dominant in your sector, burning a lot more capital. So it almost takes that whole equation. Ultimately, obviously, once you go public, you need to, to converge on cash flow break even, but you do that a, a lot later. But again, it's a very different risk profile. And even as an entrepreneur, again, you're raising money later when you're doing it at higher higher values and, and you're doing it, you know, again, there's innovation even what we do. Um, Trevor Loy, I think, is teaching right now a class, a class on this topic. Um, but again, you're doing it when it's, it's a very different risk profile. So it's something we, we have gotten a lot more conviction even over, over the, last, the last couple of funds. I want to make sure I leave time for, for questions, so I'll pivot a little bit, stand back and quickly on the industry. You've been reading the papers. Um, you know, the good news about venture is it's a small amount of capital. It's less than point, it's 0.2% um, of the assets, you know, invested um, in, the, in the markets. Um, and venture-backed companies um, uh, generate 21% of GDP and 60 million private sector jobs. I mean, it gives you a sense of the kind of impact that comes out of this kind of innovation uh, going forward on the US economy and why so many other parts of the world are looking to emulate what we, what we do here. But we are shrinking. We are down almost 80% the venture industry itself, and that's the one I'm most familiar with. By the way, not the only place to get capital. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we're down 80% from the peak in 2000 uh, when we raised, uh, when Murray and I 
created our first fund, uh, Scale Venture Partners. Um, so a big, you know, we talk, I, when I show these slides that talk about this run up in capital up to 2000 and then it drops off, I always say venture capitalists, we like exits, we should, just don't like it when it's our own. Um, and, uh, and that's true, but it's the, it's the tree that need to be pruned. It's the diet we need to go on. Um, it's actually very healthy, not just for us, but for you. Because what happened when there was too much capital is we formed too many companies, you competed on price. Um, it, was, it was a mess, you talked to entrepreneurs at that point. They didn't just have 10, 20, 50, competitors. I remember one like sub, I think it was real estate B2B at the, at the peak. There were hundreds of companies formed. How are you going to succeed and stand out? There really just, there, it, there, isn't, a, there isn't an opportunity. So I think it's, it's really healthy. And the other thing that I also think is healthy is, again, more innovation around the different types of, of capital that's available. And that was part of what we did with the Jobs Act, um, in, in particular, Angels, which really, to me, is back to the future because a lot of venture firms, if you've seen something ventured, if you haven't seen the movie, you should. And somebody on campus should, should uh, show that if you have it. It's just fabulous. Um, but it really gives you the arc. And a lot of those firms are about the same size as a lot of angels are today. So I see that as back to the future. Angels are experienced and, and I think really helpful um, to folks early on for modest amounts of capital. And that, that whole ecosystem is, is healthy and alive. Um, and also crowd, crowdfunding, we'll talk more about that. That's obviously still in the process of making its way through the SEC. But there, there are various ways to, to get capital. And by the way, not every successful company um, necessarily needs to be, needs to be venture backed. Um, I'll talk about what we look at briefly, and you probably know this well when we're, I uh, heard this many times, when we look at startups, when you walk in and are pitching, you know, the number one thing, and probably I'd say the number one piece that um, is why somebody fails with us, and I'll tell you, we look at, we probably get 5,000 plans a year, we probably log into our, our Salesforce, you know, database, um, 2,000. We probably spend time with 150, and we do six to 10. That's a big winnowing. Um, so you have to have thick skin to be uh, to pitch and to begin with. But probably the biggest challenge when it comes to getting venture backing is, is it a big enough opportunity? Is it a large enough market? Is it, is it a company or is it a product or is it a feature? By the way, it doesn't mean you can't be successful with the feature or product, but you probably want to take less capital and think about maybe you know, flipping it earlier to, to, as, a, as a feature or a product to a company put in a modest, really small amount of capital and sell it off that way. Um, but what we're trying to look at is, is it a big enough market opportunity? Is it a relevant team? You can be in your 20s, you can be in your 50s, you can be in Silicon Valley, you can be in Indianapolis, which is where Exact Target is. So you know, you don't have to be, uh, we're pretty wide open. We just want a team that's relevant and, and we're, we're open to, to what relevance means. Is this a winning solution? That doesn't always mean it's the best technology. Um, for uh, that, it, it doesn't. The best technology doesn't always win. It's really what's a winning solution. And I will say that over time, the lesson I've probably learned in watching companies and the way we now think about looking at, at investments is really understanding the user and the buyer. Sometimes those are two different people, by the way. Um, but really getting the heads not of what you're, you want them to do and what they want to see in your technology, but really understanding what the user, what that customer, what the person's going to do in the office. That's why we have um, students come through our office and we actually try to use a lot of technology. We want to get in the hands of what a user is thinking uh, when they might use this technology. And, and also your business strategy. What kind of capital strategy do you have? We've talked a little bit about that. You know, we're trying to figure out why now, why the solution, and, and, and why you. When you're doing your homework, the things that you should think about is, number one, this large market question. Am, am I, is it a big market I'm going after? Or is it, is it, is it nichier? Um, thinking about your capital strategy early on, I think is a really important part of it. Because by the time you're talking to a venture capitalist, that's part of the mix um, that you need to think about. Um, if you want to go after different sources of capital, it could be an angel, it could be, it could be venture, it could be friends and family. Um, but you absolutely have to network into that, into that firm. It, you know, it's, I, 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 when I first started in a venture, every email I got, I would, I would think about each one, I'd, I'd write an email reply, and we get so many, I, I, I literally don't have, I, I can't keep up with it, and no one in our office can. <laughs> Um, what happens, though, is that Tom sends me somebody and says, Kate, um, you know, there's something really special that I'm looking at. I don't know if, if this person is in, my, in this audience, um, but a friend that I grew up with, um, one of my next-door neighbors in, in Stockton, um, her son is an engineering student at Stanford. 
she is a teacher and, and sent me her, her son's name. Of course I'm going to take a meeting with her son. So it doesn't even have to be Tom. It can be, you know, a friend of mine, um, you know, but some way to network in a banker, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, a lawyer, um, any way you can think of. Go do LinkedIn, which is, I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn. If you've read my blog, I love LinkedIn. Uh, I love reading. I love LinkedIn. Um, and it's hugely powerful. Use as a network. Figure out who you know. We're always a few degrees away. Uh, but figure out how to get in and get in front of me. Um, you know, we, as you know, as I talked to you about investing companies that are already in revenue. Sometimes what I have is friends call up and say, you know, it's a really early stage company. I know it's in a sector you have a lot of experience in. Would you uh, give a presentation? Would you take a presentation for this company? Again, really great for you because that's a safe meeting. Um, because I'm, not, I'm, I'm a later stage investor. I want to wait till you have revenue. When Tom calls me and says, will you take a meeting with these folks early on to help them figure out when they go to meet the people that they might get money from, can you give them some pointers about how they pitch? Really, really, really helpful, helpful to do. Be optimistic, but be realistic. Confident, but not cocky. That's a fine line to walk. Um, if you come in and say, do you think this is a good idea? I'll think, well, if you don't, I'm not sure I, I, I do. Um, so you really have to come in with some conviction, but cockiness, is, it's, it's, a, it's a hard line to walk. Um, be optimistic and realistic about financing. I told you the numbers. It's hard. You, uh, we, too, raise capital into our funds. You will have more doors closed on you than will open. And you just have to decide that's a normal ratio. It's not you. That's normal. Um, be optimistic but realistic about what exits. There are very few that are big. Um, we've been lucky to have uh, two multi-billion dollar outcomes, um, a third that may be in the hopper. Um, and uh, that's very rare. In the last decade, I think there have been ten, less, than, less than 10 in the market overall. It's, it's extremely it's extremely rare. Um, so, but by the way, you can have an incredibly successful career having multiple base hits, and a lot of serial entrepreneurs do exactly that. So be realistic about that. I'll end uh, with some thoughts about um, your career. First is, and I'm proof of this, you do not need to start out as an entrepreneur. I mean, it is, it is perfectly wonderful if you want to. And I, I, we're here because so many of you want to. But as a, as a friend of mine in venture says, think about whether or not you're an entrepreneur or a wantrepreneur. <laughs> um, you have to decide if you really have it in you. Because look, look at my arc. I had no idea I'd be standing in front of you. My dad would be so happy. I'm at the engineering school. He'd tell, say, you finally made it into engineering. Um, but you know, you, who knew? I mean, I had no idea that I'd end up where I ended end up with and that I'd get this opportunity to do what I'm doing. You are playing, you have, you have an undiversified risk. As a venture capitalist, I get to diversify my portfolio. We invest in 20 companies of fund. You're investing your career. You only have one career to invest. It's perfectly fine. And we love seeing people with resumes um, in our companies, um, in venture, that have done a variety of different things. All of them, and again, we're looking for a complement of skills. We don't want everyone to be the same. So think about, you don't have to do this. It's, you know, you, you see somebody like Larry Page, and of course you want to do uh, like Larry did. Don't we all? Um, but there are a lot of people who've been successful who haven't necessarily um, start, start that way. Um, I've talked about, you know, if you decide to go that way, and even if you don't decide to go that way, keep that aperture wide, keep your options open, learn. Think about scaling yourself. Think about in either situation, even if this doesn't work out well, will my resume be better at the end? And not just on paper, but will I have learned something that I can sit in front of my next interview and say, I, I, what I learned in this job is I got to hire people. First time I got to hire people. What I got to learn in this job is I met a lot of different technology companies. What I got to learn in this job is I got to learn the competitive landscape in XYZ market. Think about that consciously, because that will give you, you know, good options going forward. Then individually, you know, it's all about, particularly if you want to be a, a, an entrepreneur, network like mad. I've talked to you about the composite mentor. That's really important. I've talked about getting a safe reality check. Um, think about going to your banker, go to your lawyer, go to your professor, go to your friend who's a VC who's maybe not interested in investing in your sector or it's a different stage. Try your, try your ideas out on each other. Try your ideas out, you know, pitching and, and, and getting a safe reality check is, is really great. Get that feedback. Make a deposit into the karma bank. Um, the best way to get help is to give it. 
Um, if you go to somebody and say, oh, everybody help me, and of course, I, you know, I'm a bleeding heart, I want to help everybody, and you only have so much time, and guess what? You know, when I'm running along, and all of a sudden there's somebody running along next to me, and they're helping me, and pretty soon I'm helping them, and it just starts to become really natural, and when somebody comes to me and says, I have something, you know, I've just read this interesting article, interesting blog, I, want, I, I think you should read, and pretty soon then we're going back and forth, and now pretty soon we have, so make a deposit in the Karma Bank, it really comes back to you. It's a great way to think about think about uh, building building a network and getting folks to, to, to help you. Um, I'm going to end before I take questions on things that are on my mind. Two things are on my mind. One, I know you'd be shocked when I say this, thinking about leaning in as a woman. I'm thrilled at what Cheryl did. Um, but when I think about leaning in, I'm thinking about everybody in this room. And when I think about what I take away from from that discussion and the discussion that that's engendered is that we each have to own our own success. And I think about not only as leaning in, but you've heard my bias about aperture, lean wide. Um, think about you know where you want to go, aim high and aim wide. So I think about leaning in, I think is, is really important. And I'm a poli-sci major, so I'm going to end on a policy note. <laughs> I have to. Um, the policy thing I am the most passionate about, and I think a number of you in the room will agree with me, is immigration and immigration reform. Um, I, there is nothing, um, and even when I sat um, uh, in the Rose Garden and I had the administration and Cantor staff both asking me, because it was such a wonderful opportunity, by the way, it was a great dialogue between people in Silicon Valley and Washington. And by the way, we sit here and we get so frustrated because it seems so obvious what people in Washington should do for us. In fact, so obvious that we think they should know this. They don't. They don't understand the world we live in. We are small. When I'm walking in a senator's office and big oil is walking out, I'm like an ant. Even backing up all of us, I'm small. Um, and, and all of us need to speak up more. We think so much about what we do here. Speaking up matters. And when it comes to immigration, I don't need to tell you how important it is to innovation, to education. Um, I have uh, an employee of, of ours who, uh, Indian, educated um, in, from Pune, uh, engineer, business, educated at, at Haas, worked at, both at Intuit, um, and, and for us, challenges with his green card, is now living in Dubai and is a student and a you know, citizen of the world is how he says it to me. It's a crime that he is not uh, building his, his companies here. He has incredible skill set. And you know, I really think we need to, to, to look at immigration reform more broadly. I come from Italian, uh, Irish immigrants. Um, that's part of what America has been built on. But particularly when we think about the innovation ecosystem, you know, keeping engineers, entrepreneurs, people who are building companies. What I encourage you to do, so my call to action, um, a lot of you are active on social media, is to get your word out, get your story out. What you don't realize is your story is even more valuable. They've heard from Apple. They've heard Bill Gates tell the story. They've heard people like me tell the story. Your story is actually more meaningful. Um, and it may be your own personal story. It may be the person in the class sitting next to you um, who may not be able to continue to build their career here or, see, or are threatened and concerned about their ability to do so. That parable, that story needs to be told. I had dinner two nights ago with Senator Warner who from Virginia, who is out here at um, uh, Madeira having dinner. He's uh, one of the sponsors of something called Startup 3.0. And he said, you guys are too timid. We're not hearing you in Washington tell your story. So I am calling on all of you who have a story to tell. It is not too small. There aren't enough other people telling it. And Tom said, you know, it's amazing. We had a ragtag group of people, um, you know, 17 of us who put together the IPO task force for the Jobs Act. Who knew that we would be successful in passing a law. You guys, your story around immigration will really resonate, so do tell it. Um, with that, I want to open it to Q&A, and thank you again for having me. Questions? Yes. Question in the audience. Do we have lobbyists in D.C.? Lobbyists? Yes. I'm sorry? I Do we have a lobbyist for the venture capital you do. Um, so the, the venture capital industry, the NVCA, the National Venture Capital Association itself, lobbies on behalf of not just the venture community, but its most important thing to lobby on behalf of 
are its companies, its portfolio companies. So we go back and we talk about patent reform and uh, FDA reform and things like the Jobs Act. Um, so that's one, but there are a lot of them. TechNet is active, Silicon Valley Bank is active on behalf of entrepreneurs. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is putting together a fund to go back and make a difference in Washington. There are more all the time, actually. So, you know, look online, and when you start to find one, you'll find threads into others. If you want to follow somebody who's really active on issues that we care about, follow on Twitter Steve Case. <laughs> Steve Case, the founder of AOL, startup entrepreneur, obviously wildly successful really active in politics. He lives in Virginia, so he's in Washington all the time. Follow Steve and you will start to hear a lot of what's, a lot of what's going on. Questions from folks? Lloyd. Um, where does the Jobs Act go from here? Good question. I keep hearing it's sort of there, but not quite there. Can you mm -hmm. repeat the question? <laughs> I, oh, the good, good point. I'll repeat the question. Where is the Jobs Act right now? Um, I have a copy of it that actually just got hung on my wall that got signed by, the, if anybody wants to come see it, you can. It's very cool. It's called a red line. Um, as a bill, or as a law, it had five chapters. I think it was five chapters to it. It may have been six. Um, the piece, Section 100, is the piece I was involved with, which is around the IPO aspect of it. And I had good advice um, in this regard from the securities lawyers I was working with. We actually didn't make a recommendation to, contract, to, to Congress we um, were prescriptive as to the Securities Act of 1933 and 1934, meaning we, e we edited the language. The day it was signed, somebody filed to go public. I believe it was Workday um, filed to go public. It was effective then. The rest of the bill, um, unfortunately from this perspective, was in essence a recommendation from Congress to the SEC saying we want to allow for Reg D, Reg A, um, these I'm talking now securities geek language, um, crowdfunding, which a lot of you might have heard about, different things that general solicitation, <laughs> things that also help companies um, throughout the spectrum from early stage um, through, through late stage, meaning IPO, um, go public. Those are still in the hands of the SEC for what they refer to as rulemaking. And, um, the SEC is understaffed and underfunded, which is the SEC chairman um, continues to, to rightly so uh, speak about. And it's probably easier when it comes to regulation to be careful about changing regulations than not. So I don't know when those will pass, unfortunately, um, because there's still a lot of debate. Um, I know that Duncan Niederauer, the CEO of the New York Stock Exchange, is actually back this week with the SEC on an advisory board basis, um, speaking to them about how to get some of these things unstuck. Uh, because th what was great was this was one of the few things that passed in Washington, and it was bipartisan. It's all about, again, the nice news. It was focused on what, what you guys are doing here, because they want to help entrepreneurs create businesses from early stage through late. So um, again, you know, put pressure on your local congressman and the SEC. So it's still being made. Yes, in the back. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about uh, looking for big op market opportunities. Could you give an example, first of all, whether you have uh, some kind of process to validate it? And then the second is, do you have a <coughs> Uh, works or doesn't Oh, that's right. Yes, um, I will. So do we, the question was, um, I talk about themes and kind of thinking about what markets we want to invest in. Do we have a process for it? We do, and I'll describe it. And secondly, um, do I have examples of what worked and didn't work? We do have a process that involves, as I mentioned, university students. University of Utah has some students that we've worked with. We use executives and residents. You know, we've all been in, in industry. We have a number of double E's, uh, one of my... Um, um, partners, Andy Vitas, actually is a master's, I got a master's in electrical engineering, took Tom Byers' class um, here. Um, we have a lot of engineering background, but we've all been in venture now for a while, so we've kind of, you know, in terms of actually doing it, we're, we're rustier um, than we used to be, and so we want to keep our freshness index high. So we like to have both users and, and developers of technology, again, university students, plus um, executives and residents, um, folks that are kind of mid-career who've been building companies in technology, um, come work with us and help us think through markets. And we, we actually go off-site multiple times a year. We don't talk about deals. We actually debate, and we actually do more debating about markets than we actually do about deals. Because once we agree on the market, it's actually easier for us to identify a winner, both its opportunities and its risks. Everything we do has high risk. Um, but, but we know kind of better what we're looking for. So we really debate that quite a bit there. And now I'll talk about things that have succeeded and failed. 
In 2009, we did a, a study, and actually uh, some Stanford students helped us um, try a lot of technology in what we called at the time backup, sync, and share. The idea was that you could use the cloud to backup data, think Carbonite, sync data, think Dropbox, or share, think Box. And we were an early investor in Box, and that is grown like a weed and been successful for us. And we really use that, this backup sync and share concept, um, as a way to go out. And we just really mapped every company we thought in that space. Uh, we tracked them. We tracked Box uh, for a while. We tracked Dropbox. They didn't do a fundraising while we were, while we were looking at that sector. Um, and really tried to get to know that space. We used a lot of the technology ourselves. I'll give you an example of ones that have not worked out as well for us. Um, you know, we, we did a lot in the healthcare space for a period of time. We stopped investing in healthcare. I did a blog on this, um, sadly, to my point, separate t uh, topic, really, because it's very difficult for us to underwrite the FDA's process. Uh, but we had a real thesis about um, different ways to go about that market. We were using repurposed drugs, going after new indications. It has been successful clinically. Um, it has been less successful because the FDA has required so many more tests, and that's taken hundreds of millions of dollars and taken many more years. Um, so that was an example of one we believed in um, early on that we've stopped doing um, uh, a number of years ago, and then one that's been really successful. We all have our we all have our our successes and our failures, and if we don't learn from them, that's that's really the issue. Uh, Last question. Yes. Just as a follow-up to that previous question, what are your thoughts currently on which sector or what are you focused on which has a win? Well, you know, it, it, there are so many interesting things. I'll tell you, we're looking, we think, you know, I talked to you earlier, we think of the buyer. We segment the world. We, we've got big trends. Mobile's a trend. Cloud's a trend. You know, those are big trends. I can't really invest behind a trend, per se. When you start combining trends and buyers, you start getting to things that you can invest in. So, you know, we, we think of the world as three types of buyers. There are many more, but we think of a consumer. And we hadn't done a lot. We, we to this date, still have not done a lot around consumer. Huge markets. Facebook, I mean, you know, it's, it's it, but, you know, consumer can go up and it can come down. There are not a lot of barriers to entry always. Um, it can be difficult. We believe in the consumer market, but we've been more interested in selling picks to miners, and by that I mean B to B to C. So we like enterprises. So we really divide the world into two kinds of people in enterprise. The poli sci major, the business person, like me. Um, and we think of that as just a business user, a marketing person, a finance person, uh, you know, CEO, whatever. You know, and that would be something like digital marketing. We've loved digital marketing. It's been the gift that's given, has kept giving to us. Uh, Omniture was online web analytics. Exact Target has been web and now social marketing. Um, we're in a company we just invested in called Demandbase, which is really targeted um, kinds of technology. We love that around the, the business user. The other uh, part we're really interested in is the IT manager. And Andy, who's a Stanford grad, has really taken the lead on this. And we're really looking at a lot of sort of the back end to mobile um, and, and cloud computing. So we've invested in a company called Boundary. That really helps you. Know, an IT guy used to have their, all their, you know, even in the early days of the web, you still had your apps on your, you know, in your center. Well, now it's up. It's on Amazon Web Services. How do I make sure that my store is up? And now it's my store, and it's not on my premises anymore. How do I make sure it's right? Well, Boundary helps you, helps you uh, do that. So, those are the kinds of things that we that we that we look at. Well, I'll end briefly um, with maybe just if to reinforce one more time about about learning. For those that haven't done the math, if I graduate in '80, Lloyd, you know the answer to this question. I'm 54. I'm going to be 55, and um, I'm an avid skier. And I um, believe <laughs> that I can get better even at 54. <laughs> now, I don't have an ACL on one knee, and I have half an ACL on the other. I'm going to be going into Stanford this summer to get the one fixed. Um, but I still believe I can get better. And part of it is, you know, uh, A, I like learning. I'm really into mobiles right now, and I love, that's how I did my ACL in January. Um, but I still think I can do it better. And the point is, I love the process of learning. And I hope that's something that, for all of you that are sitting here at Stanford, um, take with you for the rest of your life. It is a gift, and it's what will power you through um, a, lot of, a lot of things. So thank you so much for having me, Tom. And thank you so much for having me.